Twain. <laughs> Good afternoon. I don't even think I need this. I think everyone can hear me quite all right like this. That's a little bit better, isn't it? Uh, I, I do need that if you want the people at home to hear me. People at home might. <laughs> People at home might need to hear me. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Hello, everyone at home. Uh, it's streaming in, and good afternoon to everyone that's coming today. Um, pretty excited. First time that Starlight Education has come to Taiwan, so we're excited to bring this this program, this worldwide tour, to the to the island. Um, I am going to talk really briefly because I want to give everyone here an opportunity to talk to Sam. I want everyone to, at home to be, have the opportunity to hear from Sam as well. So um, I'm just going to go a quick overview about the program and then we're going to get into it. Sam will do about a 20 minute talk and then I want to get some questions from you. I'd love to hear about what you find, what you guys would like to know about the program and then also you know, what you guys would like to know about space. Now, I have got some pretty cool giveaways to the students or adults. I'm not going to dis discriminate on that one. Here's some signed pictures from Sam that he just signed before, so the ink might be a little bit wet still. And that doesn't have to be the most advanced question. It could be the most fun question or the most interesting, interesting question. I just want to see if anyone can stump Sam with space. Okay, so I've got some cool little giveaways and hopefully you can put that on the fridge and send us a photo, we'd love to see that. Okay, so let me give a quick um, rundown about one of the camps that we recently run. If you want to have a quick look, you can get the lights down or we'll just go through. See, when we're going through to our events, we do use a nice blend between design thinking, coding, circuits, 3D design and sensors. That's just a little snippet of the STEM. Because what we want to do is get these students to start to understand these disciplinary learning, see these STEM skills in a discipline learning setting. Once they know these tools, if I can get that visual, but once they know these tools well enough, we can get them to use these in combination and then hopefully in a transdisciplinary setting where we give them an unfamiliar problem with unfamiliar tools and they've got the ability to work through these, these problems. So it's a really fun week. We want the students to have a lot of STEM experiences. We want them to feel confident in problem solving and we also want them to be engaged inside of STEM. Obviously space is the topic because it's fun, students love it and we've got cool astronauts. But I'm not going to get into that because Sam will. But let's have a quick discussion right now. Just before Sam gets here, we'll just get everyone's brains on the go. Right now, if there's anyone could tell us any sort of fact about the past of space, any fact right now, and the first signed copy will go. Any students? What do you guys know about space so far? Has anyone been on the moon? What do you think? Anyone been on the moon before? Yeah. Do you know when they went up? No. Do you want to have a guess? It's all right. Anyone else want to have a guess? Any, do you guys know what, what date, what year we went up on the moon? Oh, was that a guess? 
Can we pass the first one up? Can we put that on? Congratulations. Good clap. Good clap. I don't know if that was a guess or not, but it's brilliant. Yeah, you got it. Is that right, Sam? It's right. <laughs> it's right. Okay, so then we start looking at what do we actually want? We want the students to start thinking about in the future. Because we understand what we do got right now. We understand where we've been in the space. We understand what's going on right now. But we want the students to start to dream big. What's it going to look like in the years 2101, 2117, 2030? What is, what's space travel going to look like when they're my age, which is in a little while? <laughs> I'm not going to give it all away. I'll give it all away. I might talk to you in July about that one. But what's the space, what's space going to look like? Is there space tourism? Have we got colonies on Mars? What do the space shuttles look like? Have we met new little alien friends? Maybe. Maybe they're here already. So what we want to do is get these students to really start to have a bit of fun, explore some of these thinking, some of these tools, have a bit of excitement. Right now we can see that. There's an International Space Station. There's 600 plus astronauts going up. Around 670. <laughs> That's a question for Cap. Uh, we know that this Rome is going up and that we also know that right now we want to get the time travel down to going to Mars for around a month. Now that's not there yet, but ideally if that was going to be the case, we'd like to do that. At our event, we can see that we go through the design thinking process. We, we do touch on mental health as well. And that's a really fun topic because we, don't, we can say to, say to Sam, what does it like when you're up in a capsule and you're there on your own, well, you're there with a couple of pals, you know, what does that look, feel like? Are you lonely? Do you miss people? And we try to relate that back to what it feels like on Earth. We touch on those subjects, we don't go too deeply into it. If we do, we bring in one of our experts. We do learn from astronauts, we assemble teams, we definitely assign each student with team roles, so then they start to learn what is leadership as well. And then how do we, how do we start learning from our design thinking and our STEM schools to bring it all together by the end of the week. This year it is the CubeSat Challenge. That is a really fun topic because it's not only how do students build a CubeSat using hardware and software, but how is that going to be utilised not only in space but on Earth. Now, CubeSat is completely foreign to a primary school teacher like myself. But after a little while you start digging into it about what these can do, it's a really fun subject because the students can learn a lot from it. It's also the data that we can collate, how is it going to help out humanity and the Earth. By the day five, the students will actually start to present their findings and what they found from their STEM skills, from their soft skills, their leadership skills and their presentation skills and they'll present back to us what their learnings have been. And it's a fun competition. Um, we will not give away what the prize is just yet, but there will be a prize at the end. From what I've heard, everyone loves competition and they love to win, so I'll make sure it's a really good competition. Okay, here's a bit of the survey so far. Right now we have run programs in, we've done this yeah, four continents. I'm running, yeah, it's been three countries in the last week or so, so my head's spinning a little bit, so... Uh, we've just come back from Singapore, that was a brilliant program as well. We do know that there was lots of great learning, and this is the fun part for it. Fun part for us. Would you recommend this program? Did this STEM event, did this space event improve your STEM skills? Now, again, we're not looking to get everyone to become an uh, astronaut. My goal is do I see the students wanting to run into the classroom on a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday and a Friday? My goal is, are they interested in becoming a leader? Are they interested in becoming, going into the STEM fields? Because we know right now that the STEM fields are going to be completely different in the next five years. Education is going to be completely different. We've got AI coming through and we are got to hold on tight for that. So what's it going to look like? We need to develop these students to have a mindset that they've got to be comfortable and they've got to be confident and they've got to be willing to work through these unfamiliar problems because they're coming. And that goes with the education system as well. And that's where we want our, our next generation of space engineers, our STEM engineers and our STEM leaders to come from. Here's a bit more of our student feedback. I'll let you have a read. 
sort of fellow made a little impact. You found a little green man. <laughs> and he came, didn't he? Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, let's have a big clap. We've got our astronaut Sam. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sam. All right. I well, appreciate it. So can you bring my uh, presentation up a bit there? Oh, ready to go. All right, very good. All right. Excellent. Well, so it's my great pleasure to be here today. I'm very excited to be here. My first trip to Taiwan, so this is, uh, this is a great trip. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just fun to be here, be a part of this. So, again, as Damien said, you know, th this program is not about the next generation of astronauts or creating a whole classroom full of astronauts. It's about developing students that want to innovate, that want to dream big, that, that want better things for themselves, their families, their communities. And so that's what we hope to do is to inspire students oh, to, uh, to, for those next advances. So let's go ahead and just kind of look at this movie for a second. Kind of takes us back to some of the history of the manned space program. And it's called Dare Mighty Things. And that's really what these programs are about. We want students to dare mighty things.
And the patch tells you something about the mission, usually. So if you look at the top right, you see the initials UARS. It stands for Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite. That was an Earth sensing satellite. It really had three purposes. One was to determine the chemical composition of the upper atmosphere, understand how chemicals are being moved around the planet, and then finally how much energy is put into the Earth's atmosphere. On the top left, you see a very nondescript mission patch. That was a classified flight. So classified, in fact, that the organization that we flew for did not exist. Now, you, we have a small group here today. You guys look pretty honest. Can you guys keep a secret? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, as it turns out, so can I. All right, so here we go. And of course, once we start to get selected for a mission, um, you know, we're going to go into mission-specific training for another year. And I tell students all the time, your training starts right now. Do you know you're training for an astronaut office, for an astronaut job right now? Before you'll ever sit in a spacecraft, whether that's a U.S., Russian, Chinese, it doesn't matter, European Space Agency, before you'll ever occupy that seat in one of those spacecraft, you will have spent 21 years in formal education and training. 12 years of primary education, so that's where you are right now, right? Four years of college, three years of postgraduate education, two years training as an astronaut candidate, and then finally an additional year of mission-specific training. So that's the very minimum. Most of us have spent more than that in preparation uh, for space flight. But you can see uh, there's just a whole train settings. We're also going to start to train for EVA during this exercise or spacewalk, uh, extravehicular activity. Now, a lot of people think that there's a big chamber we go into and close the door and latch it closed and all the gravity just disappears. Well, it doesn't work like that. We have to fool the astronauts into thinking they're weightless, and we do that in a water tank. All military crew. That's a bit unusual. Uh, it was a classified flight. There's no requirement to be military to be part of this program. Half of our astronauts are civilians. And, and in fact, we have flown classified flights with civilian astronauts. We just have to get them the clearances in order to do so. All right, well, I'll tell you what. I've got many, many more slides here that I can show and talk about those experiences. But like I said, really, and tomorrow for the students, I'm going to go into a lot more of this, but, but what questions do you have? I mean, I hope I've uh, stimulated a few of your questions. Yes? Has any of you, like your comrades, passed out on the way to space? None, none that I'm aware of have passed out uh, going to space, but we have had astronauts pass out coming back from space. So why is that? Why do you think that might be? going back down a bit faster, and, get, and, and really it's, it's about getting used to gravity again, right? Because we've been floating around up there and things have been easy for us, right? Working in space, is, there's certain things that are easy, certain things are not. So if, for example, I want to move this road to the back, I just have you all kind of grab your elbows together and I just pick one of you up and kind of just give you a little push, no, 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 and off you float, right? That's easy. But working in space is different. If I, if I have a bolt, that I want to remove, and I put my wrench on that on that nut, and I give that wrench a turn, what happens? The nut stays exactly where it was, and I spin around the bolt, right? So there, certain things like that are more difficult, so we have to be anchored anytime we work in space. But the other reasons, I'm gonna get back to part of your answer, is that the human body goes through dramatic changes in space. We lose blood volume, muscle, uh, muscle mass, bone mineral content, um, isolation starts dealing with your mental health a little bit, uh, your immune system is suppressed, your sense of taste is dulled. These are just a few of the things that take place when you're in space. So the reason people pass out is because of that blood volume loss didn't get recovered before they came back. So here on Earth, our blood pools in the midsection of lower in our legs. In space, it's all evenly distributed throughout the body. So the body says, okay, I don't need all that volume. So it gets rid of it in the form of just excess urine production. 
and, but that makes you a leader low when it's time to come home. Okay, so we have to get that replenished. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And so then you have orthostatic tolerance problems. In other words, your blood pressure systems are no longer able to control what you really need to survive and you'll get lightheaded and pass out. All right, what other questions? Guys, yeah, don't be bashful. What other questions? Yeah, right there. What's the farthest you've ever gone into space? How was the farthest? Yeah, so the farthest manned space craft have gone is, of course, to the moon, 240,000 miles. Now, the shuttle operates between 105 nautical miles above the Earth's surface and 360 nautical miles above the Earth's surface. And space station operates in that same range as well, about 244 miles above the Earth's surface. So if you took a basketball and you orbited that basketball a quarter inch over the surface, that would be in relative terms similar to orbiting the Earth. So when we, you know, when we looked at the moonshot, you could see the Earth as a big disk, right? On a shuttle, you can't see that. You're going to see about 1,500 miles in either in any direction, right? 1,500 nautical miles. So you'll have a 3,000 mile view, right? 36. Yeah. What other questions? Well, yeah. So yeah, space shuttle glides down. So we're traveling at 26,000 feet per second, give or take, and all we have to slow down is 300 to 500 feet per second, and gravity will just pull us in, right? So yeah, we're, we're a glider, and it's important that we get that right, because we're aiming for a runway that's 15,000 feet long, 300 feet wide, surrounded by a moat full of hungry alligators, <laughs> okay? So it's important that we get that right. Well, I got a couple of questions for you guys. What do you think is the hardest part of spaceflight? If you said, all right, uh, this is the one thing that, that I would have difficulty with or I think would be difficult, what, what is it? What do you think? Anybody? The hardest part, you think this would be the hardest part? Yeah. Like managing everything. Managing everything is, is critical because I mean, we have split-second timing. Things have to happen on a schedule in order for us to meet our science objectives. So, yeah, that, there's a lot of stress associated with that. I mean, these payloads can cost a billion dollars U.S., right? And if you get it wrong, it potentially is worthless, right? It just becomes a big mass up there that doesn't return any science. So there's a lot of pressure there for sure. The... the um, we, we work 16 hours a day and then we have eight hours of rest. So the timeline is de developed throughout the entire mission. And then we replan during the middle of the night when the crew's asleep and we'll send them a new plan if, if things change along the way. But yeah, that, that could be, what else might be difficult about spaceflight? Okay. So, all right, I think this would be the hardest thing about spaceflight. Yeah. Staying healthy. Staying healthy, you bet. Because like I said, the body, is going through all these changes. And uh, it's not like you can go pull over and go to the doctor, <laughs> right? Now we do have a medical officer on, on the mission, or in the mission control center 24 hours a day. There's always a doctor um, in the mission control center 24 hours a day, and he or she will be available, and if we have any kind of serious illness on the, on the spacecraft, they'll ask us how we're doing twice a day anyway, um, but if we have any other medical issues, then they'll set up what we call a private medical conference. So nobody else can monitor the, the network or know that the communication will be just between the patient and the doctor, right? Um, so, uh, and if we have two astronauts that are always trained in, in emergency medicine in case we do have, you know, problems. So they can give shots, administer narcotic drugs if we, if you have serious pain issues or those kinds of things, we do carry some antibiotics. So there are some things that, that we, we can do. But think about a Mars mission, right? That's a three-year mission. You know, it takes you a year and a half to get there and get back. Well, if you're gonna spend that much time on the road, you probably wanna spend 18 months to two years on the planet. So you, you could be potentially looking at three, three and a half year mission uh, easily. 
And so, yeah, health becomes a, a real a real issue, right? Should I have my tonsils and my adenoids and my appendix and my gallbladder all taken out just as a precaution, just in case they get inflamed? I don't need that stuff for the most part. So, you know, should I, I mean, all of that kind of stuff is being discussed right now, right? Yeah, what else do you think might be difficult? Yeah. I wouldn't say you need to sleep more. I would say that, uh, you know, for me, I always slept the full eight hours, pretty much, and I've been happy to hit the snooze alarm a couple of days as well, right? We don't have a snooze alarm, but if we did, I would sure have it. Um, yeah, you're tired. There, there, there's a lot, I mean, in addition to the stress of space flight, you also have the acoustic issues of space flight, right? The spacecraft, it's like a ship, right, you know? I don't know what the dB, what the noise, you know, typically on the ship, it's what, 50, 60 dB hum all the time? Yeah, humming, all the yeah. fishing, all the engines, yeah. the all that stuff, yeah, and, and so you have all that noise going on in the background, and it's fatiguing, you know, over time, right? So I was always tired. Where it gets really scary is when there's no noise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that happens every couple days because we would change. Now, it doesn't happen today because we changed the system now. Um, but the, the lithium oxide canisters that scrubbed out the carbon dioxide uh, from the cabin, uh, those are basically filters and, and they, we pull air through them and, and there's a couple big environmental fans that move that air. So when we change those filters, we have to shut those fans off. So you've got this 50, 55 dB hum in the background, you know, all the, all the fans, all the motors running, and then all of a sudden it just goes quiet. And that, that, that's a little unnerving, to be honest with you. There's a little bit of comfort in a hum there. All right, what else? Yeah. So for me, uh, my, my, my missions were short, five days, five days, and 14 days. I mean, they were long at the time. It was the second longest, my 14-day flight it was the second longest shuttle flight in history at that point. But now with the International Space Station, we're spending 365 days or more in space. So in terms of, you know, one of the most coveted badges now, you know, you see this Mach 25 badge up here? That tells you that I've gone 25 times the speed of sound. Right? So now you'll see some 365 badges that the astronauts are wearing. They also have this Mach 25 badge, but like 365. It means that they've been in space at least 365 days of, of their life. So that's the new coveted badge, you suppose, so to speak. Uh, well, I'm going to share with you what I think is the, the most difficult part. Oh, okay, go ahead. I have an idea. I think it's loneliness. Loneliness. Pretty close. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. It, it's not that you're as lonely necessarily, because remember, the mid-deck is about the size of this table. A little bit bigger. Maybe, let's extend it out here. Maybe, oh, another 20% here, 25%, and then extend it out to about here. And that's the room that you have on the mid-deck on the shuttle. We're going to put five people here and live 14 days. So conveniently, we've got five. Well, actually, we have six right here. We've had eight-person crews. So we can use, so we can take the six of you, put you up here. We'll come back in a couple of weeks, see how you all doing. <laughs> now you have to eat, sleep, work, shower, shave, everything use the bathroom, everything in this space, right? 14 days. And if you think about the International Space Station, we have, we have crew members from at least four countries on there right now. Don't share common language, don't share common culture, and yet, nobody's killed each other yet. Nobody's killed anybody yet. <laughs> you know, it, it's a testament, I guess, to the professionalism of the crews that you can get along and you, you do, but so it's not that so much loneliness because when you're this close, 
there's, there's a lot of, you know, a lot going on there. And for me, it was an overwhelming feeling of insignificance. Right? You look back at the planet and, and eight and a half billion people back here, right? And you're five people who are off the planet. I mean, what does that even mean to be off the planet? It's happened three times in my life. I still don't think I have an appreciation for exactly what that means, right? But the most difficult part of space flight, I think, at least for me, was the night before. When you're sitting alone in your room, eight to 12 hours before liftoff, and you honestly have no idea what the outcome of tomorrow's flight will be. And it's not that I feared for myself, although, trust me, I had plenty of unfinished business I wanted to take care of. I didn't want to check out of the net at that point. But you feared for your family, spouses, kids, moms and dads, all those people that, you, that you'd leave behind, right? Whose, whose lives would be irrevocably you know, changed in a moment of tragedy out there on the launch pad, right? Or, or during the course of that mission. And, and I always say it was my dream to fly in space. And while they were proud and you know, certainly uh, encouraged me, it was not their dream. But they would be the ones that ultimately would have to pick up those pieces. So, quick question. Yeah. I know. I know we're coming out here uh, a bit later on in the year. Yeah. We'll probably have a bit of a talk. But why? Why we're bringing the CubeSat? What's the importance of doing a CubeSat? Oh yeah, the CubeSat. I mean, when you, the, it's a it's a great vehicle for learning for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, we start with all of the hardware and the mechanics of all that individual component testing. So, you, you know, it's kind of a, uh, we go through the design, the, the build process, the manufacture, so students get a chance to do all of that hands-on. Uh, we test the components at the, sub le at the component level just for, you know, verification, validation that they all work, and then we're going to put them together as an integrated unit and I'll ultimately retest it to make sure that it tests out and that it meets its objectives, it meets the specification of, its, of the build. And then from there, we're going to do the data or the data collection and finally the data analysis and reduction. And so you see all of that from the design to the manufacturer to test and check out uh, to, the, to the launch, to the data collection, reduction. So you see kind of the whole end-to-end -end process. The other piece of that I think the CubeSat brings is it allows students, maybe for the first time, to actually fail. <clears throat> and not feel bad about it. Because sometimes these components don't work. Sometimes the designs don't work. And so what do we do with that, right? Well, it's not, it's not a failure, it's, it didn't work. Let's go back, redesign, retest, remanufacture, and re, you know, fix it back. I was talking earlier today, you know, Thomas Edison, when he was asked about the light bulb, he said, you failed a thousand times. He said, I didn't fail a thousand times. I tried a thousand things that did not work. <laughs> so he didn't look at it as failure. So the, the, you, know, you teach perseverance. And, and the other thing I think is that when we look at these teams and how they compete, we set them up kind of to compete against each other. And then we talk about who the real competition is. And the real competition is getting this thing to do its mission successfully. Right, it's not about whether I beat you to the punch or not. Right, it's about how do we get this thing done? How do we how do we get this mission complete? And and so the, some of those lessons come up as well in that. Yeah, and I think the main a big emphasis is the learning journey. And as you spun yeah. on for just before, it's how do we get students to start to learn how to fail fast <laughs> in an industry and in a world where the criteria is you're going to win when the wind is being created and being adaptive and into an environment that it was foreign to them previously. Yeah, I mean, we want to introduce perseverance to the students as well, right? And so sometimes you do fail, sometimes these things don't work the way you thought. Maybe they don't work in the first time, you, you maybe assembled it wrong, incorrectly. We're going to help you through that. Uh, you know, the one story of perseverance that I'll share with you is one of my astronaut colleagues that applied to the astronaut office in 19... 
uh, let's see, 1978, was interviewed and not selected. So uh, well, that's a setback, but it's not the end of the world. So she reapplied in 1980. She was interviewed and not selected. So most of us would have said, okay, I've had two interviews, I didn't get selected, probably not going to happen, right? We'd be discouraged at this point. I know I would have been. Well, 1984, she applied again. <laughs> was interviewed, not selected. Okay, so now we've had three applications, three interviews, and three non-selects. Now what? 1985, she applied again. This time, she didn't even get selected for an interview. So, we've had three applications, three interviews, three non-selects, now a fourth application, and we did not even get an interview. How many of you at this point would have said, okay, it's not going to happen, right? Well, not this one. In 1987, she applied again, got interviewed, and got selected. So, you know, part of this program is to teach perseverance, right? We had one team in, I think it was Bangkok, they made 13 attempts to get their satellite to work. Finally, on the 13th attempt, it worked. Could you imagine how happy they were? <laughs> and what a sense of accomplishment that was? And, but that's the point, right? It's the thousand things that didn't work. It's the thousand tries that just didn't work. It's not that I failed a thousand times, it just didn't work, right? So for many of them, for many students, that's the first time they'll ever be introduced to that concept, yeah. right? Finding fast. So in your experience, so I know we've been doing these programs for a little while, and we've seen a lot of, a lot of things you and I You've seen a lot of Sam, is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> so I've seen a lot of things. Um, what, give me one of your favorite moments at one of these camps. But what did, like, as a student that, or a parent that's going, okay, you know, thinking about, you know, it's having my student come along, what are the students going, yeah, I'm keen. What's one of, from your astronaut experience? So, the so yeah, so there's a couple things that come to mind. So on, uh, recently in, in a uh, CubeSat in Dubai, right, we had, you know, teams, and we had a couple teams that were struggling to put their satellite together. And we gave the teams the opportunity to give some of their, so we grade everybody, we give them points, right? We kind of set up this competition so everybody gets points for certain accomplishments. So the, the, we gave the teams, didn't mandate it, we gave the teams the opportunity to give some of their resource to other teams, right? And the lead team did. And I asked the leader of that particular team why you did it. He said, we made an investment in those guys, right? And so that was a great moment to, to, for him to recognize that, you know, I just didn't give away a bunch of points and now it's going to put us in last place, which it did, by the way. It put those guys in last place when they were leading the pack. He, he said, no, I, I made, we're going to make an investment in this team. And so ultimately, you know, that team was able to succeed and, and they still led at the end of the exercise, right? The team that gave away the points was still leading at the end of the exercise. So that was a great moment. Um, but even more than that, I was contacted by this same uh, young man uh, to write a letter of recommendation for him for Purdue. So I was happy to do it. And so, you know, to be able to kind of see this feedback loop and to see where they're going, that's, that's by far the best, yeah. yeah. So what, saying that student asked for a letter to go for an application to university? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't get much better than that. Doesn't get much better. And then from an engineering perspective, Purdue is, is pretty darn good. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, we're going to have it's a produced program. a lot of astronauts, by the way. Yeah, hopefully one more. Well, yeah. What's that'd that'd well, hopefully one more. Yeah. 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 Right. No, we can get him out on the cheap. Um, we'd love another couple of questions. Other than after that, we're going to invite you guys down to have a photo with Sam. Hopefully, if that's interested. I'm sure it is to some of the students. So maybe if there is a question or two from the parents around here, or yeah. Yes, uh, there's a question like that. Sounds like you run this uh, camp a couple of times, and then there sounds like a lot of things for you try to achieve and cover. And it's like a five day enough. 
Yeah, so so it, it is a lot to it, it is a lot to cover. I think, but if you look at the way we build the program, we, we start with the uh, day one typically was just a clean sheet design project. You're only bound by your imagination, but you have to tell us what it's going to take to build this thing, what components are on there. We're going to give them a, a space-based problem. They're going to come up with a design. Could be earth protection, could be alien detection or life detection, could be, could be any number of things, resource um, uh, you know, observations, uh, environmental, atmospheric, whatever it could be. Uh, anyway, and then they'll design that. It'd be an open-ended project, but they'll have to tell us what they think they can bring it to market for, right, whether their budget. And then, and then the, the next day, we, we kind of talk about launch systems and launch design, and they build their own rocket. And, they, and then in the afternoon, we go into some of the CubeSat component testing and, and some of the initial elements of that. And next day, we're going to build up a little bit. We're going to talk about maybe on-orbit operations. And the third day, we're going to talk about recovery, parachutes and capsules and how we recover spacecraft. So that kind of takes place all in the morning, those kind of blocks take place in the morning and in the afternoon they'll go into more CubeSat, more CubeSat, more CubeSat, work with the hardware and, um, and, and as, it, as it turns out, um, we've done this in a two-day program as well, but now the two-day program is, is quite different, but on a five-day program, uh, no, I think at, at this level and, and um, with the design challenges and the building blocks, it all, it all works. Yeah, and the students are challenged. I mean, the students are challenged. They're not. They're not going to be. Oh wow, well, I'm just sitting around doing nothing. No, they're going to be challenged. In five days to do this, they're going to be challenged. Yeah. Any other questions? One more question up the back. I'll run up there, and then we're going to get some photos with Sam. I, I can do this. I can do yeah, but no one at home can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can we see the? So, um, do students need a certain level of coding foundation? Like, do they have to do some coding? I'm going to let Damien take that one because that's his expertise. That's his wheelhouse. We, we start from a baseline and we work everyone up from the same level. Now, we do have, um, there is a differentiation level in each session that we can go up and down. Um, but as from last week, you know, we found that there is levels from each group, each student. And we do give that ability to make sure that they can excel if they need to, but we can also pick them up. Um, for example, coding, I can get the students up to scratch pretty much with no experience at all. I'll get them up to scratch in a session. Um, and if they want to get onto the block coding, that's easy. And then if they want to transverse that learning into script, that's quite easy as well in the same system. Um, but again, that comes down to the talent of teachers, and that's why we've got educators that come that are experienced, qualified, registered teachers along with engineers and astronauts. And you go, how do we know he's an astronaut? Because he got a photo. <laughs> so we bring registered teachers for that exact reason. And we're lucky enough to find these teachers around the world. Um, typically, we've seen some great educators here. They're quite, now, Brian is amazing on those computers. So when we find the really interesting teacher that wants to come away, we can actually pull them out for a couple of weeks and come with us. So we're in a really unique position for that. Okay, well, that wraps up us talking because uh, I know that everyone wants to get, well, some people might want to get a photo with Sam and we've got to probably get out a little bit after five. So if you would like to get a photo, can we get a nice system of walking down that way, please? Stan, I'll do, a, I'll do a nice scenario. You walk down this way, you go, hi, Cap. <laughs> get your photo and then walk up this way. It's not the first time I've done that one, is it? It's not the first time. So, Cap, can, can we get in front of this? Is that all right? Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, we can do that. Because yeah. these pictures, well, let's uh, go back to one that's a little bit more. Because these pictures, like so many others, were taken last week. Like that one. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Any of these are good. Uh, let's see. Oh, that one's great. Can get the cover one there. Oh, yeah, this one is a before and after. <laughs> like I said, all taken last week. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll be the first. Come on, parents. Right. Come on, kiddos. Don't be bad.